let's say a prayer, and we're going to get rolling with our presentation. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this opportunity to share our pilgrimage to Israel. Thank you for the interest, and thank you for the support. Um, we all went on this journey together. And so, uh, give us your spirit, and let this time be filled with joy and learning and insights. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start off with an overview of the whole um, journey put together by Bradley Posadas, and we do want to have somebody in the back by the lights. Uh, is there anybody back there? Um, let's see, Lynn, you're going for it. Good. So the bottom bank is what we want to turn off, and we'll. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. We were gonna. I'm breaking the rules already. I'm messing everything up. I am so excited that we got this working. What we want to do is let me just inter mention all the names, and then Julie's going to say um, an opening prayer for us that was used one of our last days. Um, uh, one of our last days on the tour. So we had Bill Yoakum and Darlene Yoakum, John and Marilyn Adair, Kevin and Karen McNamara, Tom and Stephanie Taft, Bradley and Ellen Posadas, um, Ace Edwards, Bill Crabtree, Russ Goodman, um, Julie Harpole, Evie Randall, Donna Cameron, Patricia Egan, Melissa Ottenbacher, known as Lisa Ottenbacher, um, Julie Gillis, uh, Lois Hall, Ethel Nelson, uh, Peggy Grigg, Catherine Swan, uh, Melanie Cameron, and Deborah White. Did I miss anybody? All right, that's our whole crew. So, do you, have, you got the mic, Julie? Julie has, we've learned, has a real gift for prayer, and she wrote a beautiful prayer, and we wanted to share it with you to start us off today. Oh. We got to turn it on. Pastor Bill had us take turns um, giving prayers every day. I had the honor of doing the opening the first prayer we ever did. This was the last one we did. I think we were um, heading back from Jordan, back to Jerusalem. And it's called Footprints. Gracious God, thank you for walking with us as we have been tracing your steps throughout this land. Our footprints are here now. Some steps have been small, some long, purposeful steps. There have been painful steps, wet steps, and dry, dusty steps. Each step brought us closer to you and gave us a better understanding of the love you have for each of us. God's people come in all shapes, colors, personalities. Hebrew 8.10 says, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. The fellowship of faith that has sustained and supported this group of believers has enriched us forever. We are bound together, sometimes saints, sometimes sinners, but always gods. Our bodies are tired, our minds are racing with facts and information, and our hearts are overflowing with love and appreciation for Russ, Ofer, Pastor Bill, Duby, Julie, Torek, Sam, Hemsa, Esau, Ashley at Magdala, and Anne at the Garden Tomb. There is a saying that goes, some people come into our lives and quickly go. Others come into our lives, stay a while, leave footprints on our hearts, and we are never the same. Each of these people has made this experience so meaningful, and they have truly left their footprints. We especially thank you, Lord, for walking with us every step of the way. Be with us now as we journey back home, knowing that we leave our footprints and a piece of our hearts behind. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So beautiful. What a gift. All right, so now, and you guys want to scoot right in here to the middle so you can see? That's perfect, because we have some of the Sunday school classes wanted to hear and see about the trip, too. So welcome to all of you. So this is our just overview.
kind of boring <laughs> on the top of Mount Ebo.
before we head out on the Sea of Galilee. Two veterans got to raise the flag on the Jesus boat. some of these places. Let's 
over our guide. With the little hair. <laughs> we always can find them. One of the possible places. Yeah. It's a first century tomb, right by the hill that looks an awful lot like a skull. <clears throat> Galilee, I said to my dear roommate, oh, 
it's much larger than I thought. You know, on the, on the maps of Israel, there's this big, long Dead Sea, and then there's this little spot that says Sea of Galilee. And actually, I was thinking, like, Wild Cat Lake. <laughs> <laughs> and my roommate said, oh, it's a lot smaller than I thought. <laughs> we went to different Sunday schools, evidently. <laughs> but it's a really important place, and we saw just wonderful things. Um, South in Jerusalem and south, the landscape was very bare looking, uh, very tan, just rock and not much vegetation. But up north, uh, they have a lot of fruit and vegetable farms, and it was just very beautiful and lovely. And around the Sea of Galilee, it was very, very pretty. And just being at the sea, and the first thing we did was to have the affirmation of baptism. Um, and of course, our guide kept saying, well, the, the the lakes are all so low, they're so low, you know, they've gone down below what the usual seashore was, and, but it didn't matter, we plunged on down there, and um, had had a pastor had prepared a liturgy for us for both our communion services and for our affirmation of baptism, so we had some guidelines and, and some song, and then um, we were invited to, you know, step closer to the water, and I tripped and almost went head first. <laughs> and uh, Julie and I splashed water on our faces with great joy. And, uh, and really, it was a, a wonderful thing to do. And then we uh, went around more of the Sea of Galilee, and we stayed in Tiberias and, uh, for two nights and uh, saw things in the outlying area. But the day after our affirmation of baptism, then we did ride on the Jesus boat, and we all got a certificate to prove it. <laughs> A picture there, um, and somebody asked, the boat really looked fascinating, how old is this boat? He said, oh, about 20 years. That <laughs> wasn't actually Jesus' boat. Um, but we did see uh, where we had the affirmation of baptism, there is a gift shop, and um, a museum where they are preserving the boat that they found in recent years that was, they assume, um, could have been at the time of Jesus. Um, so the replicas make you feel like that, but floating on the Sea of Galilee, it was just a group on the boat, and there was a teaching moment, and you know, Ofer had to tell us what he had to tell us, and then Pastor Bill told us uh, some things and reminded us of the things that Jesus had done on the Sea of Galilee, and while we're sitting there meditating, another boat goes by us, and they're singing gospel hymns, <laughs> and they're singing gospel hymns, it happened to be uh, kind of a gray day when we were there, um, it was it was just a lovely thing to do. Um, after um, after our morning on the Jesus boat, then we went on farther and we went to Magdala. And um, uh, Donna will tell you more about Magdala. But Pastor had already alerted us about how he loved that place. And it's the city where Mary Magdalene is from, and where Jesus did a lot of teaching. And it has only recently been rediscovered. It was covered by a mud flow, and then commerce and so forth moved away from that area, uh, but recently discovered it, and the was being taken away. So we actually stood on the stones where Jesus stood. And um, a group, um, my brochure said it's a Catholic group that has control of it now and are building a retreat center there. And they have just some lovely, I didn't see any pictures of those. Right, right there. Oh, there's many of them. That's the yeah. synagogue, yep. Isn't that something? And you can actually stand These are the those. bench seats where Jesus would have sat and taught. So, yeah. Pastor Bill wanted to know how we each felt about the trip. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, I developed a walking case of bronchitis while there, and many of my companions developed it after they got back. But, <laughs> so I couldn't sing while I was there, but I kept. <clears throat> For those of you who are music-minded, music was in my head the whole while. And I was thinking, I walk today where Jesus walked and felt him close to me.
white spot in the road, we got a lesson. <laughs> so anyway, but the bad thing is, I'm the kind of person if you, I'm like the eight-year-old at Toys R Us. If you take me to someplace interesting and then you say, let's have a lesson, it's like the eight-year-old, okay, well, Toys R Us, let's study your spelling. So it's like, okay, tell us all those stories again and tell us that they were from the trip. When I was a kid, I loved geography. They don't teach it very much anymore, but for me, geography makes everything become real. And I like the Sea of Galilee because living in western Washington, I like water. It's very tranquil for me. So it was a place where there was green, it restored my soul. It was very calming for me. And um, we stayed in Tiberias. That was our home base. And we went from Tiberias to Magdala. So the thing I wanted to say about Magdala is they have a wonderful worship center there. They have combined modern with traditional art, so they've created mosaics in these little worship rooms that are simply spectacular. And then you go into the main worship center, and you have a boat for an altar, and the front of it is blue, blue glass, and then behind it is a reflecting pool, and behind that is the Sea of Galilee, and it's just like this extension of it. It's simply beautiful. And um, I have a friend who's a lapsed Catholic, and there was a picture down in the bottom worship place that was a woman touching Jesus' garment and being healed. And um, she couldn't take her eyes off that picture. That was the most moving picture to her. Like, this is so wonderful when art can speak to people. So, so around the other places we went, we stayed in Tiberias. It's a very ancient name. And our hotel was kosher and had a synagogue in the basement. <laughs> That's a new experience for me. Um, we went to the Sermon of the Mount Mountain, the Beatitudes Mountain, which was simply beautiful. Again, we're in a very beautiful place and had a wonderful lesson. Then we went to Capernaum. Capernaum was a wealthy city. It had homes that had stone parkings over the doors. And the synagogue was big. So it was, it was a very impressive old city. That's where Peter's mother-in-law was. And when you hear about Jesus healing her, he's like a, less than a block from the synagogue to her house. It's very interesting. That way. Um, we went to Tagba, that's where Tabga, that's where the multiplication, the feeding of the 5,000 was. And um, they have a little fish up on their weather vane. <laughs> and they also had it depicted in mosaics. So mosaics are a big part of art back there. And they're, they're very spectacular to see. In fact, if we have two seconds at the end, I want to talk about the mosaics at the um, Crusaders Castle in Jordan, but we might not have time. And then, um, what I loved was um, Jesus' ministry. All our favorite Bible stories come from the area around Galilee where he's healing, he's multiplying food for people, he's preaching and teaching them. And then comes Jerusalem, but when we're under stress, we like to retreat to where we're comfortable. And after the crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus says both in Luke and in Matthew that I'll meet you in Galilee. So he goes back to Galilee where the fishermen are fishing. And it's in Galilee where Jesus says, do you love me, Peter? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep. He's telling us about our mission statement, where we go from here. So Jesus' ministry both begins and has a sense of completion around Galilee. And I found that very moving. What have I forgot? I think that's it. Thank you. to comprehend with our minds alone. When you visit Jerusalem, the people, the culture, your senses, your imagination, your heart, and your soul will help you to understand more about who Jesus is. Our journey began looking down from the Mount of Olives at the panorama of Jerusalem below. As we walked from the Mount of Olives down the steep 
Palm Sunday Road, I imagined Jesus being welcomed with palm branches and cloaks during his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. This day there was an old bent man in a black robe who was begging, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. As we continued down the hill, we came upon a Jewish cemetery. When someone visits a tomb here, they leave a small stone, symbolizing their hope for the rebuilding of the temple. It made me think about the temple of Jesus' body being raised up. A bit farther down the road, we entered the Garden of Gethsemane and gathered together among the ancient olive trees, maybe a little like the twelve when they gathered there with Jesus. Pastor Bill taught the word, and we celebrated Holy Communion there in the place where our Savior prayed and where he was betrayed. Meditating for a few minutes under one of the ancient olive trees, I could hear the sounds of the city just outside the garden gates, as Jesus may have as he prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Jesus' soul was overwhelmed with sorrow, and yet his disciples could not keep watch with him for one hour. I felt convicted and thought, I am no different. Reading the words of John chapter 1 in the garden was a powerful experience. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. The creation didn't recognize its creator, and God's own chosen people did not receive him. This is part of the picture of Jesus as God, the creator, unknown by his creation. It is also part of the picture of Jesus as man, one of God's chosen people, and yet rejected by them. From the garden, we proceeded down the hill to the Church of All Nations, which you saw in Bradley's pictures there, also known as the Basilica of the Agony. This Roman Catholic Church was built over a rock, called the Rock of Agony, where it is believed that Jesus prayed on the night before he was crucified. Many nations contributed to the construction of this church, making it a special place of partnership in faith. God's word says in Acts 8, 9, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Continuing our walk, we came to the pools of Bethesda where Jesus healed a paralytic who had been an invalid for 38 years. Such an amazing miracle for this man and the onlookers. And yet, the Jews persecuted Jesus for doing this great miracle on the Sabbath. Thanks to our knowledgeable tour guide, we learned about Jesus' Jewish culture and the many laws that the Jewish people live by. These understandings helped us to appreciate the difficulties Jesus faced when introducing his new ways of thinking. God's plan for salvation continued with Jesus being tried on the pavement and then sentenced by Pontius Pilate to death on the cross. Jesus then walked the Via Dolorosa, or Way of the Cross, through the Old Town, carrying his cross, falling under the weight of it, and even consoling lamenting women along the way. We walked this sorrowful way as well, imagining what it was like for our Savior and being so grateful to him. Although many believe that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the place of Jesus' death, death and resurrection, I felt very connected to these events at Golgotha and the Garden Tomb. Perhaps this is because the hillside and the garden tomb are in a more natural state. The skull on the hill at Golgotha is not as clear as it once was, but is still noticeable. The garden tomb is steps away from Golgotha and makes it easy to imagine John 19, verse 42. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The door of the garden tomb bears the inscription, He is not here, for he is risen. Have you ever noticed that the words say, He is risen, not He has risen? Learning about the Jewish people and their culture, taking Jerusalem in through my senses and imagination, and touching it with my heart and my soul, deepened my faith. I am so grateful that Jesus drank the cup of judgment and gave us the cup of blessing. 
and incredibly thankful that it replaced the law with promise. I pray for Jerusalem that Jesus' own will accept him. I also praise God that, as wonderful as it is to be in Jesus' earthly home, he gave us his Holy Spirit so that we can be with him anyway. Learned that 
the people building this ramp were Jewish slaves, they were very reluctant to try to kill these people in building the ramp, even though they knew that when that ramp was done, they were done. They all knew that when the Romans conquered, they killed everybody. Just about. If you were killed, you were a slave. It was not a happy ending. So they continued this, and eventually they did. They actually pushed up this big battering ram. They entered the, the actual city and found that over 900 Jewish people had committed suicide. And they committed suicide rather than be killed or enslaved by the Romans. And they also found that there were huge food supplies left over. So it wasn't like they starved to death or didn't have water. They chose to take their own lives. Which even today, <coughs> Jewish people feel that this is something that can never happen again. This is our olive oil, so to speak. So we had a great, um, and of course, the actual settlement up there was built by Herod the Great. Interesting. It was one of his palaces. And so we walked all through that and saw how that was constructed and, and eventually became uh, the Jewish settlement. And then it was all put into ruins. And then not too long ago, it was all taken over again. And we had a choice of either uh, going up on a cable car or walking up what they call a snake trail, which is about a thousand feet. That's uh, Bill. That's Lisa. And so we took the tram. Here. <laughs> we could see these trams coming over, and we waved at them, not knowing which tram. <laughs> but it was it was a good experience. And Stephanie and, and Russ. Yeah, Russ ended up being at the end for some reason. We couldn't keep up with this. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Excellent.
And many times the churches have gone to rack and ruin and, uh, and destroyed or fallen in, but they'll uncover, when they rebuild, they uncover these beautiful, beautiful mosaics. And we think back to the, in Magdala, where we saw the synagogue where Jesus preached, that was up on the shores of the Galilee, you can see the original ceramic floor. It's wavy because it's fallen in, but, but it's still there. And uh, from, from Mount Nebo, we went to a town called Madaba, which is in Jordan. And we went to St. George's um, Orthodox Church there. On the floor, there's a partial map of, of the, uh, oh, the state of Palestine. It's the earliest known map of Palestine. And I, I have this, if I'll have it later, if you want to see it, a picture of what's left of it. In the late 1880s, a group of Christians came to, to Manila to build a church, well, to live, and they could build a church as long as they built it on the site of any uh, existing church. So they dug down through the ruins and they found this, in the floor, this mosaic map. Much of it destroyed, but, but a lot of it's still there. And it was over, um, over a million pieces of ceramic. This, to make this mosaic. It was just quite incredible. I asked our, our guide, I asked our guide if um, he went to that church. He said, he just smiled and he said, no, he said, I'm just a Christian. And he, he, he wouldn't label himself as being you know, orthodox. Or, I'm yeah. just a Christian. <laughs> About 4% of the Jordanian population is Christian, so it's very small, but it's also, um, it's very visible when you're there. There are a lot of Christian sites in Jordan. In fact, our guide said, you have to consider, or you have to think about Jordan also being part of the Holy Land. We talk about Israel and about Jerusalem, but he said, it's all part of the Holy Land. And that's about all, I guess. <laughs> because it's under Palestinian control. So, yeah. so this is just a picture of kind of the, the, the town or the, the, the city of, of Jerusalem, New, uh, Bethlehem, New Bethlehem. Um, we worshiped at Christmas Lutheran Church, uh, which is the oldest Lutheran church in Palestine. It started in 1854 by German missionaries. It's one of six churches in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. So what Lois said, Jordan is considered um, a part of the Holy Land too. It's primary, it has 200 members, its primary language is Arabic, and the service was held in Arabic, although it, we did sing some songs in English and Pastor Bill did a reading in English. The church was um, constructed 1886 to 1893. There are 14 stained glass windows that are original, uh, and the writing on them is in German. 
But 20 years ago, they painted the copula or the, the, the center, inside center of the church 20 years ago. This is a picture of the outside of the church, beautiful stone building. And this is the inside. Um, very nice and, you know, Lutheran churches to me are just very um, majestic in that they don't have, they're not ostentatious at all. And this church was not in any way. But this is the copula. And it's, it, there's a phrase in Arabic. Anyone know what this phrase is? <laughs> sure. Well, I saw this. And I had had some struggles kind of connecting until I looked up and I saw this. Because this connected us. And worshiping in this place connected us to the Christians throughout the Holy Land. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men, is what that says in Arabic. This is where God became flesh. Where the Word became flesh in the birth of our Lord and Savior. Not at this church. I'll talk about a little bit about the um, Church of the Nativity. This is um, um, Mr. Naser, and I think Julie was it. I took this off of, of the Facebook page, but this is the Bob Green on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was the main usher, so and we had a wonderful time with the um, with the members afterwards in their fellowship hall, um, talking talking with them and visiting with them. <laughs> This is Isa. He was our um, tour guide for the um, four hours or so that we were in Bethlehem. Um, we had three main tour guides. We had Ofer in, in, in Israel and Jerusalem. We had Isa in Bethlehem. And then we had Sam in Jordan. And Isa was probably the less opinionated of all three of them. <laughs> probably because we just didn't have that much time to spend with him. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the pictures of the Church of the Nativity. So the Church of the Nativity is the oldest functioning church in the world. It has been functioning as a church for over 1,700 years. And it was um, built in approximately um, 326, 327 A.D. by um, Constantine and his mother Helena. Um, based on what they were told was the site of Jesus' birth. I don't know if you remember some of the other pictures, but you um, it, it's built on a cave. You go down into this area um, where the birth is reported to be, and there's an altar there, and there's a bunch of ornamentation. Um, the thing about this church is that it's controlled by... Four, congregate, four different um, religious congregations. Roman Catholic, um, Greek Orthodox, um, Syrian, and I think Armenian. And I was reading some stuff about it, and they said that oftentimes they have disagreements over the control of the church, and they've had to call the police in to settle some physical, <laughs> physical fights about it. So that's going down, Pastor Bill and Ace going down into the into the um, cave area. And that's the site. You know, I have it in my heart for children. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. Um, I know Julie has children in her heart too. To be there. probably one of the funnest things I think we did, at least for those of us who went through the wet tunnel. I don't know about those who went to the dry tunnel. But um, it, it, Hezekiah's tunnel is, is dug into this um, area over the city of David in Jerusalem. And it, and it 
runs between the Gihon Spring and the Pool of Shiloa or, Shilo, or Siloam. And its purpose was to deny water to the Syrian army that was expected to lay siege to Jerusalem to provide a water and to provide a water source to Jerusalem during that siege. It's about a third of a mile in length, and it has a um, less than a one percent gradient, but there is a little bit of a gradient so that the water flows its length from the spring to the pool. And the tunnel was discovered in 1838 by the American biblical archaeologist Edward Robinson. This is kind of a, a, a cut through of it, so you can see how far we were underground going through this tunnel. This is Russ, our tour director um, with Face Space Expeditions. Russ went through the dry tunnel. But if ever I felt blessed on this tour and that there was a godsend and that God was watching over us, it was having Russ on this tour with us. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of, of why that was, but he, he saved us. <laughs> um, oops, I don't know what happened. Oh, there it is. The entrance to the tunnel. That's Pastor Bill. This is evidence, Pastor Bill, that your backpack was open oh. before you oh, went into no. the tunnel. <laughs> I have photographic evidence. That's bad. This is, this is um, I think that's probably Bill Yoakum. There were some points in the tunnel, the tunnel was so narrow that the, some of the guys had to go through sideways. Um, there are areas where it's so low that you have to bend over. I didn't have to bend over as much as <laughs> Bill and Tom did. Um, you know, we, we reaffirmed our baptism at, um, at the Sea of Galilee, but for me, um, this was reaffirming my baptism because I had claustrophobia and there was a great angst turmoil here about going through the this tunnel, but I did it. So and that's how I felt about it. <laughs> Julie, please do and then I know we'll run five minutes over and do some questions if you can real quick. So I want to thank all my tour members that came up that were brave and came and spoke in front of all of you. So let's give a round of applause. Thank you. We're going to let some um, questions, but if you are interested, Pastor Bill and I are thinking, it's not absolute, but we are thinking about going again to Israel in 2019 around the same time, the end of March beginning of April, and there's sign-up sheets on the tables, and if you are interested, I will be contacting you again probably next spring. So think about it, pray about it, and hopefully you can join us again if it all works out, 2019. Thank you, Julie. And thank you to Julie because it was part of her and the devotion team back uh, a number of years ago. They got this whole thing started. So let's take a few minutes, but before I, so I don't forget, Ace uh, also scooped up some soil from the various sites that we were, and he's willing to give that, you know, some of you that might be meaningful. Um, there's a little thing here you can sign up, and he will get you some some of the soil from those places, because I know some of that, sometimes that's really helpful and cool. So I wanted to mention that. Questions that jump to mind? Um, anything, everything, please. There we go. Okay, so when we read scripture of places that Jesus was where he uh, did miracles and things, or where he just spoke on a mountain top right. of the attitudes. Right. Um, you know, we picture in our mind just out in a bare place, um, or, you know, nothing special. But, of course, what exists now in those places that they've identified where he was, they've built um, churches, churches and, yeah. and things. Yeah. And so that, of course, is a different picture. Um, how do you? How did you feel about that? Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm not no, making a judgment you. on so, it. But it's just different than what we picture in our head when we read scripture. 
So the real quick answer to that is some of the places like the Mount of Beatitudes, we don't know exactly where it was. So you could go outside and be on the hills that might have been there. Um, as Lutherans, we're not quite into the shrines that maybe some other Catholic, other traditions are. Um, so it was a combo for me, um, and I think for a lot of people, um, to see the reverence for people about these sites and how, like, the where Peter, where Jesus got out of the boat in the Sea of Galilee and cooked breakfast, there's this rock, and, you know, they don't know for sure, but I mean, it's like, well, this could have been it, you know, and so you do get, you, you kind of get both. I would say I got both. Um, the sites do sometimes take away from it, like you go on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it's beautiful, but you, the garden tomb is much more like what it would have been. And so even if that's not the place, it's you have more of that experience. But then you see the people, you know, kneeling and touching the spot where the cross was, which is also in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it just, it does something to you. So that would be my quick answer. It's a great question. Other questions? Yes. Lisa. Jesus? 600 years. It's one of the, the great engineering feats of the world that they did at that time. No compasses, no GPS. Just, they met, they went from both two sides and they met in the middle. And uh, so it's, it's a, a pretty amazing thing. Julie.
quick, and then unfortunately we're going to run out of time. Yeah, Bill? Well, we forgot one important thing, and I don't know why the photographs weren't shown of the Dead Sea. Yeah. And it did like use out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of laughing, too. Yeah, why did what happens in the Dead Sea stays in the Dead Sea. Right. You asked for it. Oh, no! Oh, no. Let's see. Let's see if you can do it. Yes. Can you shut the door? Salt. It's so salty you float like you're like you just you float this high up in the water. It's hard to even stay up. Okay, um, unfortunately we are out of time. The one thing that people always ask and no one asked here is is it safe? Is there anybody that went on the trip that ever felt unsafe one time? Only in the Dead Sea. Only in the Dead Sea. All I can tell you is I felt safer in Israel than I did in Europe. And if you are afraid of going to Seattle to go to something, then don't go to Israel. But if I feel safer going on this trip than going on a ferry into Seattle. I'm just being totally honest. So, anyway, that's, so that's up for you to think about as you think about. Thank you, Chris, for that question. Lots of things for us to tears. Keep talking to us, and we'll talk to you about that. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you, God.